America is essentially a dream. It is a dream of a land where men of all races, of all nationalities, and of all creeds can live together as brothers. The substance of the dream is expressed in these profound words. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. One of the first things we notice in this dream is its amazing universalism. It does not say some men, but it says all men. It doesn't say some, it doesn't say all white men, but it says all men, which includes black men. It doesn't say all Gentiles, but it says all men, which includes Jews. It doesn't say all Protestants, but it says all men, which includes Catholics. That is something else that we notice in this dream, which is one of the the things that distinguishes democracy and our form of government with other totalitarian systems. It says that there are certain basic rights that are neither conferred by nor derived from the state. In order to discover where they came from, it is necessary to move back behind the dim mist of eternity. They are God-given. Very seldom, very seldom, if ever in the history of the world, has a socio-political document expressed in such profound, eloquent, and unequivocal language the dignity and the worth of human personality. For the American dream reminds us that every man is the heir of a legacy of dignity. And yet ever since the founding fathers of our nation dreamed this dream, America has been, to use a big word that the psychologists and the psychiatrists use, a schizophrenic personality, tragically divided. On the one hand, she has proudly professed the noble principles of democracy, and on the other hand, she has proudly practiced, or she has sadly practiced, the very opposite of those principles. Indeed, slavery and segregation have always been strange paradoxes in a nation founded on the principle that all men are created equal. So often, America has trampled over the dream. So often, America has scarred this noble dream. We look and see certain states saying they will never comply with the law of the land. In doing this, America is scarring the dream. We notice people who merely want to be free, being brutalized, homes being bombed, churches being bombed. This is a way of scarring the American dream. We notice people who merely want to exercise their citizenship rights being thrown into jail. 
This is a way of scarring the dream. And we can hear the voice of a little Emmett Till crying from the rushing waters of Mississippi. This is a way of scarring the dream. And so the Negro is still trampled over by the iron feet of oppression. And so often he has been pushed out of the glittering sunlight of life's July and left standing in the piercing chill of an alpine November. This is scarring the American dream. May I say to you, as has been said so eloquently all the afternoon, this dream is being scarred not only in Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana, and all of the southern states, but it is being scarred in New York, in uh, Illinois, in Pennsylvania, and I imagine even in California. <laughs> the fact is that the Negro all over America is still the last hide and the first five, and he still can't live where he wants to live and where his money can get him to live. But today, more than ever before, America is challenged to bring this noble dream into reality. For the shape of the world today does not afford us the luxury of an, of an anemic democracy. And the price that the United States must pay for the continued exploitation of the Negro and other minority groups is the price of its own destruction. People are looking over to the United States today and they're wondering what we are doing about this problem. They're looking over from Asia and Africa. For years, most of these people have been dominated politically exploited economically, segregated, and humiliated by some foreign power. But today they are gaining their independence, more than one billion, six hundred million of the former one billion, eight hundred million colonial subjects have their independence today. And they are saying in no uncertain terms that racism and colonialism must go. The hour is late, and the clock of destiny is ticking out, and we must act now before it is too late. It is trite but urgently true that if America is to remain a first-class nation, she can no longer have second-class citizens. I must hasten to say that we must not solve this problem merely to meet the communist challenge. We must not seek to solve this problem merely to appeal to Asian and African peoples. This problem must be solved in the United States because segregation and discrimination are morally wrong. It must be solved because Segregation relegates persons to the status of things and stands against all of the noble principles of our Judeo-Christian heritage. It must be solved not merely because it is diplomatically expedient, but because it is morally compelling. This must be said all over the world. And I would say that there are some things that we must continue to do in order to make the American dream a reality and save our nation in this hour. And I would like to mention them as briefly as possible and elaborate on them briefly. First, in order to make the American dream a reality, we must seek to make the world dream a reality, and therefore we must begin with a world perspective. For you see, the world in which we live is geographically one. And now we are challenged to make it spiritually one. Now it is true that the geographical oneness of this age in which we live 
came into being to a large extent through man's scientific ingenuity. A man through his scientific genius has been able to dwarf distance and place time in chains. Yes, we've been able to carve highways through the stratosphere. And our jet planes have compressed into minutes distances that once took days. Bob Hope has described this new jet age in which we live, and I think he's given an adequate description. He said it is an age in which it is possible to take a non-stop flight from Los Angeles to New York, and if on taking off in Los Angeles you develop hiccups, you will hick in Los Angeles and cup in New York City. <laughs> you know, it is possible because of the time difference to take a flight from Tokyo, Japan on Sunday morning and arrive in Seattle, Washington on the preceding Saturday night. And when your friends meet you at the airport and ask when you left Tokyo, you will have to say, I left tomorrow. <laughs> this is the kind of world in which we live. This is a bit humorous, but I'm trying to laugh a basic fact into all of it, and it is simply this, that through our scientific genius, we've made of the world a neighborhood. And now through our moral and ethical commitment, we must make of it a brotherhood. We must all learn to live together as brothers or we will all perish together as fools. This is what we must do. And it simply means that every nation must be concerned about every other nation. Every individual must be concerned about every other individual. Some months ago, Mrs. King and I journeyed over to that great country known as India. I never will forget the experience, the experience of talking with and meeting with the great leaders of India, and meeting people in the cities and the villages all over that country. A noble and marvelous experience. And I say to you this afternoon, there were those depressing moments. How can one avoid being depressed when he sees with his own eyes millions of people going to bed hungry at night? How can one avoid being depressed when he sees with his own eyes millions of people sleeping on the sidewalks at night? In Calcutta, more than a million people sleep on the sidewalks every night. They have no beds to sleep in. They have no houses to go in. How can one avoid being depressed when he discovers that out of India's population of 400 million people, more than 365 million make an annual income of less than $60 a year, and most of these people have never seen a doctor or dentist. As I noticed these conditions, something within me cried out, can we in America stand idly by and not be concerned? And an answer came, oh no. The destiny of India and the destiny of every other nation is tied up with the destiny of the United States and the destiny of the United States is tied up with the destiny of India. And I started thinking about the fact that right here in America we spend more than a million dollars a day to store surplus food. And I found myself saying, I know where we can store that food free of charge in the wrinkled stomachs of the hundreds and millions of people who go to bed hungry at night. Maybe we've spent far too much of our money in the United States establishing military bases around the world rather than bases of genuine concern and understanding. All I'm saying is simply this, that all life is interrelated. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly, it affects all indirectly. As long as that is extreme poverty in this world, no man can be totally rich even if he has a billion dollars. As long as diseases are rampant, as long as diseases are rampant and millions of people cannot expect to live more than 28 or 30 years, no one can be totally healthy even if he just got a checkup in the finest clinic of the nation. Strangely enough, I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be, and you can never be what you ought to be until I am what I ought to be.
This is the way the world is made. This is the interrelated structure of reality. John Donne caught it years ago and should place it in graphic terms. No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. Then he goes on toward the end to say any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind. Therefore, never sin to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. This is the meaning of having a world perspective. If we are to realize the American dream, the other point is that we must get rid of the notion once and for all that there are superior and inferior races. We must make it clear all over this land and all over the world that a doctrine of white supremacy has no basis in anthropology, has no basis in scientific thinking, and has no basis in morality. Now, you know, people used to argue, this thing still gets around, people used to argue that the Negro uh, was inferior by nature. And they went back in the Bible and they would get up certain passages in the Bible. It's a strange thing how people will use religion often to justify their prejudices. And they would go back in the Bible and they would say, now the Negro is inferior by nature because of Noah's curse upon the children of Ham. And you know, that was a great philosopher back in Greek philosophy by the name of Aristotle who did a great deal to set up formal logic and he would have what was known as a major premise, a minor premise, and a conclusion. And so one brother during the days of slavery wanted to justify slavery and uh, he had set his argument up on the framework of Aristotle's thinking. He could say now all men are made in the image of God and then came his minor premise, God, as everybody knows, is not a Negro, therefore the Negro is not a man. This is the kind of reasoning that prevailed. But today, uh, we don't hear these arguments too much. Uh, they argue now on more cultural and subtle sociological grounds. Uh, the Negro is not culturally ready for integration. And uh, if you integrate uh, schools and if you integrate too much, uh, the Negro will pull the white race back a generation. And then they go on to say, you know, that the Negro is inherently criminal and uh, all of these things. Now, these people never say to us that many of these problems are problems of urban dislocation and that poverty, ignorance, and disease breed crime, whatever the racial group may be, that these conditions are environmental and not racial. And it is a torturous logic to use the tragic results of segregation and discrimination as an argument for the continuation of them. The thing to do is to get rid of them. So over this nation, we must get rid of the notion once and for all if we want to realize the dream that there are superior and inferior races. Now, that is the final point that we must, the final thing that we must do in order to realize the American dream. We must continue to engage in creative protest to break down the barriers of segregation and discrimination. Now I know that there are those people who are the victims of some strange illusions. And uh, they don't believe in the necessity for continued pro protest. One illusion is a myth of time. They say, uh, just wait and don't push things and be patient and pray and, and time will work this problem out. You've heard that, I'm sure. These people fail to realize that time is neutral and it can be used positively or negatively. We've seen this myth at work in the South. And the fact is that the segregationists at points have made a much more effective use of time than some other sources of goodwill, even the federal government. And I am convinced that we may have to repent not only for the blatant vitriolic words of the bad people, but for the appalling silence of the good people. Talking about time. 
We must get rid of the notion that human progress rolls in on the wheels of inevitability. We must come to see that human progress is never inevitable. It comes through the tireless efforts and the persistent work of dedicated individuals. And without this hard work, time itself becomes an ally of the primitive forces of social stagnation. We must make it clear that the time to do right is now and that the time is always right to do right. Now, the other illusion is the myth of educational determinism, as I call it. You've heard these people say, now you've got to change the hearts of men. That's the only way you can solve it. And I guess that's true, uh, to solve it ultimately. And they'll say, it takes education to solve this problem. It's an educational process. And therefore, it can't be done through legislation. It can't be done through judicial decrees. It can't be done through executive orders by the President of the United States. It must be done through education. Now, I, I, I think it's right that education must work in this whole area, but it is both education and legislation, not either legislation or education. Now, it may be true that morality cannot be legislated, but behavior can be regulated. I guess it is true that uh, the law can't make a man love me. Religion and education must do that. But the law can keep him from lynching me, and I think that's pretty important, too. And so it means that we must push on in legislation, in the North and in the South. Every state should have a Fair Employment Practice Commission so that there will be no discrimination in this area. Every state needs a fair housing law so that it will be made clear that there can be no discrimination in housing publicly or privately, and that even real estate people who will try to perpetuate this will have to stand before the bar of justice. This must be done all over the United States. And then, we must continue to delve deeper into the philosophy of nonviolent resistance. That is something about this method that has power. And I know that there are those who will ridicule it occasionally, but it has worked miracles in the South. It has morality with it because it gives us the opportunity to work to secure moral ends through moral means. This is the morality of it, but it has certain practical consequences. It exposes the moral defenses of the opponent, somehow weakens his morale, and all at the same time it is working on, its, on, on his conscience. It disarms him, and he just doesn't know what to do with it. If he puts you in jail, that's all right. If he doesn't put you in jail, fine. If he beats you up, that's all right. If he doesn't beat you up, that's all right. If he tries to kill you, all right. You develop the quiet courage of dying, if necessary, without killing. If he tries to threaten you, all right. If he doesn't. And that is something about it which causes the opponent not to know what to do. Now, he would know what to do with violence. He could call out the state militia. He could call out the National Guard and kill hundreds and hundreds of innocent people and argue that they are inciting a riot. They know how to handle violence, but they proved over and over again that they don't know how to handle non-violence because they throw people... <laughs> they try to handle it by throwing us in jail. But what happened? We go into the jails of Jackson, Mississippi, and transform these jails from dungeons of shame to havens of freedom and human dignity. I can't stop it. I believe firmly that this is the way. Now, that is another aspect of it, about this method. And people ask me about it all the time. So, what do you mean when you tell us to love these people who are beating on us and 
bombing our houses and kicking our children around. What in the world do you mean when you say love such people? And I always have to stop and try to define the meaning of love in this area. And interestingly enough, Greek philosophy comes to our aid at this point. There are three words in the Greek language for love. One of them is the word eros. Now, eros is a sort of aesthetic love. Uh, the philosopher Plato talks about it a great deal in his dialogues, the yearning of the soul for the realm of the divine. It has come to us to mean a sort of romantic love, and so we all know about eros. We've experienced it. We've read about it in the beauties of literature. In a sense, Edgar Allan Poe was talking about Eros when he talked about his beautiful Annabelle Lee with a love surrounded by the halo of eternity. In a sense, Shakespeare was talking about Eros when he said, Love is not love, which alters when its alteration finds or bends with the remover to remove. It is an ever-fixed mark that looks on tempest and is never shaken. It is a star to every wandering bark. You know, I can remember that because I used to quote it to my wife when we were coding. That's Eros. <laughs> Then the Greek language talks about phileo, which is another level of love. It is an intimate affection between personal friends. On this level, we love because we are love. We love people that we like. This is friendship. Then the Greek language has another word called agape. Agape is more than romantic love. Agape is more than friendship. Agape is not something affectionate. Agape is understanding, creative, redemptive goodwill for all men. It is an overflowing love which seeks nothing in return. Theologians would say that it is the love of God operating in the human heart. And when one rises to love on this level, he loves men not because he likes them, but he loves every man because God loves him. And he goes on with that. And so he rises to the level of hating the system rather than the individual who is caught up in that system. He loves the person and hates the evil deed. And I think this is what Jesus meant when he said, love your enemies. And I'm happy that he didn't say like your enemies because it's pretty difficult to like some people. It's difficult to like people bombing your home and threatening your children and kicking you about. But Jesus says, love them, and love is greater than like. Love is understanding, creative, redemptive goodwill for all men. And somehow, more and more, I've come to believe this. Yes. That this is the way that we will get out of this dark night of oppression and make of this nation a better nation. It means that we can stand up and allow the, allow the opposition to know that we will not accept injustice. Yes. We will stand up against it with our lives, yes. but we will never stoop down to the level of violence and hatred. And we will come to that point when we will be able to convince him that a new world is emerging. And I tell you this evening that it will give us the right attitude. Yes. I know sometimes how discontent we get, and we have a right to get discontent, and how frustrated we get in the process sometimes. But I submit to you this evening that this way of nonviolence will help us not to seek to rise from a position of disadvantage to one of advantage, thus subverting justice. We will not substitute one tyranny for another. For black supremacy is as dangerous as white supremacy. Yeah. Yeah. I am convinced this afternoon that God is not interested merely in the freedom of black men and brown men and yellow men. God is interested in the freedom of the whole human race and the creation of a society. I believe with this method and this approach, we will be able to win. And finally, as we struggle, we do not struggle alone. It's dark sometimes. It's difficult, and particularly for those who are struggling in the deep south, facing all of the violence and all of the suffering. But that is something that consoles us along the way. We are convinced that our cause is right. I return to Alabama, Mississippi, and Georgia, not in despair, not in bitterness. I return knowing that we are moving into a bright day of freedom. And we, through our struggles, through our suffering, through our sacrifice, 
will be able to achieve the American dream. And this will be the day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. My little daughter loves to ride to the airport with me. She says to me so often, Daddy, you just go over and over and over again. And so one of the ways she consoles herself in the fact that her daddy has to be away so much is to ride to the airport whenever I'm going in or coming back into town or going out of town. And she can do it if she isn't in school. And as we pass on the expressway going to the airport in Atlanta, we pass by what is known as Fun Town. Now this is an amusement center where little children go to play and where they go for recreation, something like Disneyland and something like the very fine amusement centers across the country for young people. And as we pass Fun Town so often in the car, she would look over to me and say, Daddy, I want to go to Fun Town. Well, I could always evade the question when we were going by in the automobile because we were passing by and I could jump to another subject. And I didn't want to have to tell my little daughter that she couldn't go to Fun Town because of the color of her skin. But then the other day we were at home and like most children, she likes to look at television, and she was looking at television, and they were advertising Fun Town, and she ran downstairs and said, Daddy, you know I've been telling you I want to go to Fun Town, and, and they were just talking about Fun Town on the television, and I want you to take me to Fun Town. And oh, I stood there speechless. How could I explain to a little six-year-old girl that she couldn't go to Fun Town because she was colored? I had been speaking across the country talking about segregation and discrimination, and I thought I could answer most of the questions that came up, but I was speechless for the moment. I didn't know how to explain it. Then I said to myself, I've got to face this problem once and for all. And I took a and called over, and my wife was sitting on the other side of the table, and I took the, my little daughter and told her to have a seat on my knees. And she jumped up in my lap, and I looked at her and I said, Yolanda, we have a problem. I said, you know, some people don't do the right things, and they are misguided. And so they have developed a system where white people go certain places and colored people go certain places. And I said they have fun town like that so that they don't allow colored children to go to fun town. And then I looked at it at that point because I didn't want her to develop a sense of bitterness. I didn't want her to grow up with a sense of hatred and bitterness in her heart. And so I had to rush on and say, but now all white people aren't like this. There are some white people right here in Atlanta who would like for you to go to Fun Town. And there are some all over the country who are right on this issue. Still, there are those who have been misguided. And then I looked down into her eyes. And I said to her at that point, and I saw tears flowing from my eyes at that point, I said, Yoki, even though you can't go to Fun Town, I want you to know that you are as good as anybody who goes into Fun Town. <laughs> and I want you to know, Yoki, that some of us I'm working hard every day to get Fun Town open and to get many other places open. And I say to you that in the not-too-distant future, 
from town and every other town will be open to all of God's children because we're going to work for it. We don't need to utter but three words to tell this nation what we are talking about. They aren't big words. You don't need to have a great vocabulary to utter them. You don't need to have a philosophical bent to grasp them. They are three little words. But we want to let the world know that these words describe what we mean and what we are determined to do about racial injustice. One is the word all. We don't want some of our rights. We don't want a few token handouts here and there. We want all of our rights. The other word is here. There are some people who, who, who say that we need to go back to Africa. And then there are some others who tell Negroes in the South to leave the South. You can't be free, so get out. But down in Alabama and Mississippi and Georgia and South Carolina, we are saying something else now. We want all of our rights, and we want all of our rights here in Alabama and Mississippi and South Carolina. And then there's a third word. It is the word now. We are not willing to wait a hundred years for our rights. We are not willing to wait 50 years for what is ours on the basis of the Constitution of this United States and the authority of God himself. No, we are not willing to wait another 25 years for our rights. We can hear voices telling us to slow up. We can hear voices telling us to cool off. Our only answer in calm, patient turn must be that we have cooled off too long, and if we keep cooling off, we'll end up in a deep freeze. We must go on and say... No, what we are saying to this nation is that we want all of our rights. We want them here, and we want all of them not next year, not next week. But we want them now, at this hour. This is what we're saying. We must work through the courts, through legislation, through the ballot. This is what we've been talking about over these last few meetings, the necessity of registering and the necessity of voting. And this is one of the most significant steps that the Negro can take at this hour going to the ballot box. But I would like to give you a warning signal. I've tried to talk in militant terms for the last few minutes. But in the midst of this militancy, let us always realize that we don't have to hate as we try to straighten this situation out. Let us always realize and we don't have to become bitter as we try to straighten this situation out. And oh, my friends, if that is any one thing that I would like for you to remember this evening, it is the fact that somebody must have some sense in this world. Somebody must have sense enough to meet hate with love. Somebody must have sense enough to meet physical force with soul force. If we will but try this way, we will be able to change these conditions and yet at the same time win the hearts and souls of those who have kept these conditions alive. And I know the temptation. I know the temptation which comes to all of us. We've been trampled over so long. I know the temptation that comes to all of us. We've seen the viciousness of lynching mob with our own eyes. We've seen police brutality in our own lives. We are still the last tired in the first five. So many doors are closed in our faces. 
And that is a temptation for us to end up with bitterness. And I understand these people who have ended up in despair. I understand why there are some who have been a little misguided and they've ended up feeling that the problem can't be solved within. And so they talk about racial separation rather than racial integration. I understand their, their response. I have analyzed it psychologically and I understand it. But in spite of the fact that I understand it, I must say to them in patient terms that that isn't the way. I must say to them in patient terms that black supremacy is as dangerous as white supremacy. And God is not interested merely. God is not interested merely in the freedom of black men and brown men and yellow men. But God is interested in the freedom of the whole human race and the creation of a society where all men will live together as brothers. No, we need not hate. We need not use violence. That is another way. A way as old as the insights of Jesus of Nazareth. It is modern as the techniques of Mohandas K. Gandhi. That is another way. A way as old as Jesus saying, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Pray for them that despitefully use them. And as modern as Gandhi saying through Thoreau, non-cooperation with evil is as much a moral obligation as is cooperation with good. That is another way. A way as old as Jesus saying, turn the other cheek. And when he said that, he realized that turning the other cheek might bring suffering sometimes. He realized that it may get you home bomb sometimes. He realized that it may get you stabbed sometimes. He realized that it may get you scarred up sometimes. But he was saying in substance that it is better to go through life with a scarred up body than a scarred up soul. That is another way. This is what we've got to see. No, that is a power in this way. And if we will follow this way, we will be the participants in a great building process that will make America a new nation. And we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. This is our challenge. This is the way we must grapple with this dilemma. And we will be a great people. And let us have faith in the future. I know it's dark sometimes. And I know all of us begin to ask, how long will we have to live with this system? I know all of us are asking, how long will prejudice blind the visions of men? And darken their understanding and drive bright-eyed wisdom from her sacred throne. When will wounded justice, lying prostrate on the streets of our cities, be listed from this dust of shame to reign supreme among the children of men? Yes, when will the radiant star of hope be plunged against the nocturnal bosom of this lonely night and plucked from weary souls the manacles of death and the chains of fear? How long will justice be crucified and truth bear it? How long? I can only answer this evening, not long. We shall overcome, deep in my heart, I do believe, we shall overcome. No, I join hands so often with students and others behind jail bars singing it. We shall overcome. Sometimes we've had tears in our eyes when we joined together to sing it, but we still decided to sing it. We shall overcome. No, before this victory is won, some will have to get thrown in jail some more, but we shall overcome. Don't worry about us. Before the victory is won, some of us will lose jobs, but we shall overcome. Before the victory is won, even some will have to face physical death. But if physical death is the price that some must pay to free their children from a permanent psychological death, then nothing shall be more redemptive. We shall overcome. Before the victory is won, some will be misunderstood and called bad names and dismissed as rabble-rousers and agitators, but we shall overcome. And I'll tell you why. We shall overcome because the arc of the moral universe is long. 
but it bends toward justice. We shall overcome because Carlisle is right. No lie can live forever. We shall overcome because William Cullen Bryant is right. Truth crushed to earth will rise again. We shall overcome because James Russell Lowell is right. Truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne. Yet that scaffold sways the future. Behind the dim unknown standeth God within the shadow, keeping watch above his own. We shall overcome because the Bible is right. You shall reap what you sow. We shall overcome. Deep in my heart, I do believe we shall overcome. And with this faith, we will go out and adjourn the councils of despair and bring new light into the dark chambers of pessimism. And we will be able to rise from the fatigue of despair to the buoyancy of hope. And this will be a great America. We will be the participants in making it so. And so as I leave you this evening, I say, walk together, children. Don't you get weary. There's a great camp meeting in the town.